Good morning and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online in this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session. Our speaker today is Professor Martin Henry. Martin Henry is Professor of Gravitational Astrophysics and Cosmology at the University of Glasgow. He's a senior member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, which made the first detection of gravitational waves in 2015, a discovery awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize for Physics. Martin himself was awarded in 2015 an MBE for his services to the public understanding of science. I know Martin for his ongoing support and talks to our local astronomy club, Highlands Astronomical Society, and he's been contributing talks in Orkney for 25 years and his visits always generate much appreciation. Today, Martin surveys the brief history of gravitational wave astronomy and the remarkable technological innovations that have made it possible. From the pioneering research of Professor Ron Drever of Orkney descent to the development of the advanced LIGO detectors. He looks at what lies ahead as new technologies will push the detector sensitivity to even greater limits. I want to encourage you to take part in this event and ask you to please enter your comments and questions in YouTube's live chat and I'll present them to Martin after his talk. Martin, over to you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning and to be able to share some of the exciting recent history of this new field of gravitational wave astronomy. So let me just share my screen with you and then we'll be all set and ready to go. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. I'm really delighted to be able to join you this morning. Um, I've been a visitor to Orkney, as you just said, to the festival many times in the past. I didn't realize it was as long as 25 years, but again, I'm delighted to be here again, even if this year it's online. And I do look forward to the opportunity, I hope, before too much longer to be able to visit in person. So as we just heard in those brief words of introduction, um, I'm a senior member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. So that's a group of more than 1,400 scientists worldwide who together with our colleagues in the Virgo and CAGRA collaborations are very much at the forefront of this new field of gravitational wave astronomy. So in my talk this morning, what I want to do is to share with you the discovery of gravitational waves. We made that discovery almost exactly six years ago on September 14th, 2015. And that confirmed the predictions of Albert Einstein's theory of gravity, his theory of general relativity. That prediction emerged from Einstein's work 100 years earlier. And realizing that prediction and actually making the discovery in 2015 opened an entirely new window on how we study the universe and its most extreme phenomena. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. So we announced that first ever detection about five months later on February the 11th, 2016. We just heard there the immortal words of Dave Reichsey, the executive director of LIGO, who broke the exciting news at a video um, conference, a press conference that was held in Washington, D.C. on that morning. And well, um, I think it's fair to say that our discovery was a really big deal. It was featured on the front pages of more than 900 newspapers the following day, as well as hundreds of TV news bulletins and websites worldwide. Now, this was partly just due to the great public interest that there has always been in anything to do with Einstein and indeed in black holes. But it was partly also because of the astounding technology that had made our discovery possible. Quite simply, the twin LIGO detectors are the most sensitive scientific instruments ever built. And the quest to achieve the incredible precision needed to discover gravitational waves, well, that took an effort 
of decades by this huge global team of scientists. Now, it's fair to say as well, I think, that it didn't take long before our discovery was recognized by a spate of global prizes awarded to the scientists in LIGO and indeed in Virgo as well. And those included the Physics World and Science Magazine Breakthrough of the Year Awards, the Gruber Cosmology Prize, the Team Achievement Award of the Royal Astronomical Society, and the Breakthrough Prize for Fundamental Physics. Now that last prize, you can see Morgan Freeman up there in the top left of my screen, that last prize was particularly special. It's in some ways almost like the Oscars for science. And it was awarded both to the collaboration members as a whole, including myself, and singling out three of the LIGO founders, including one scientist, Professor Ronald Drever, whose family ancestors came from Orkney. Now the Breakthrough Prize ceremony, like I say, it really is like the Oscars for science, that took place on December 2016, just a few months after we'd announced that first attention. So here we see the Breakthrough Prize founder, Yuri Milner, and actress Sienna Miller presenting the award to the LIGO co-founders Ray Weiss, Kip Thorne, and representing Ron Drever, who sadly was already in very poor health even by that time, Ron's nephew Thomas. Now you can watch the whole video of the award ceremony on YouTube, at the link shown here. And I think that link will be added to the YouTube webpage for this presentation as well. So by all means, have a watch and you'll see the events unfold. But the award ceremony told the story of the incredible technology of the LIGO detectors and how they observed those colliding black holes using laser interferometers. Now I'm gonna tell you that same story this morning, but before we get into any of that, first I'd like to see a few more words about Ron Drever and his role as a LIGO founder. Now, as we said, by December 2016, Ron was already in failing health and was unable to join his colleagues in person at the Breakthrough Prize ceremony. And sadly, he passed away in March 2017 at the grand old age of 85. Now, that loss was felt very deeply throughout the entire LIGO family and, of course, in Glasgow University where Ron had begun his study of physics and then first established himself as an outstanding experimental physicist. The following initial claims of the detection of gravitational waves that had taken place in 1969, claims that would later come to be regarded as spurious, Ron was nonetheless inspired to set up a whole new research program on gravitational wave detection at Glasgow. So in the upper image on the right here, we see Ron as a young lecturer in Glasgow in the early 1970s, together with an even younger Jim Huff, now Professor Sir Jim Huff, alongside one of the prototype detectors that they were building. And in so doing, they were pioneering some of the techniques in laser interferometry that would later give LIGO its remarkable sensitivity, and indeed its first two letters, because LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer gravitational wave observatory. Now, one of the key breakthroughs that Ron made in those early days was to find a way to stabilize the outputs of the lasers used to search for gravitational wave signals. He adapted a technique that was developed for radar during the Second World War and created a method that's now known as the pound driver hall laser stabilization. And that's become central to how LIGO works. So together with other colleagues in Glasgow and Germany, Ron then went on to also pioneer techniques that we call power and signal recycling. And those greatly increased the sensitivity of the laser interferometers, again, critical to early aspects of the LIGO design. Now, by this time in the early 1980s, we've now got the color image in the bottom right of my screen here. Ron was working at the California Institute of Technology and that's where he initiated plans for a prototype gravitational wave detector. At the same time as similar plans were being formed in Germany and indeed at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So in 1983, the Caltech and MIT teams joined forces to build a full scale interferometer and the LIGO project was born. Initially under the direction of the three breakthrough prize winners, that's Drever, Revice, and Kit Thorpe, and well, scientific differences emerged between them, frankly. 
But Ron remained with the project, even though he remained for only a few years, as Ray Vise quotes in his obituary in Nature, that's shown on the left here, and you, you can find it on Nature's website, Ray says the following. It says that Griever and I had different views about the direction for technical development of LIGO. But he goes on to say that we always respected each other's views. And as LIGO's construction progressed, we became close colleagues and friends. So the journey from Ron Griever's co-founding of LIGO in 1983 to the first detection of gravitational waves in 2015 would take more than 30 years of scientific inspiration and indeed perspiration. And in the remainder of my talk, I want to tell the story of that remarkable journey and where the future of this exciting new field in astrophysics might lie. So I'll focus on three main questions, some aspects of which will expand on what is covered in that video from the Breakthrough Prize ceremony. So you can go and watch that afterwards as well and, and get and their take on this story. But I'm going to give you a slightly more in-depth treatment of the basics of gravitational wave astronomy. We're going to talk about what are gravitational waves, how can we detect them, and what can they tell us about the universe. So why are gravitational waves so hard to detect? And why did it take 100 years from Einstein's prediction to their eventual discovery? Well, there's a commonly used metaphor it's attributed to the American physicist John Wheeler that seeks to kind of capture the spirit of Einstein's theory of gravity without recourse to all of the complicated mathematics that underpins it. Wheeler summed it up like this. He said that in general relativity, space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. So Wheeler was building on Einstein's vision of gravity, not as a force between massive bodies, as Isaac Newton would describe it. You know, that's what we learn about when we learn about Newton's laws at school. But instead, to think of gravity as the consequence of those masses warping the very shape of space-time itself. Like thinking of the Earth sitting on a vast sheet of rubber, which is a bit like what the cartoon illustration on my slide is trying to convey. The presence of the mass of the Earth will bend the shape of the rubber by the mass of that body. Now, in that metaphorical picture, we can think of the gravitational waves as wobbling of the rubber sheet itself, caused by the rapid acceleration of massive bodies changing the space-time warp. So just like in this slide, we now see the rubber sheet moving, distorting because of the rotation of our two massive bodies around each other. So gravitational waves are the ripples in space-time itself when, for example, two black holes or two neutron stars orbit rapidly around each other. Now, like ripples on a pond, when you throw a stone into the water, gravitational waves will spread out through the universe in all directions. And when you plug in the numbers, what you find is something really quite remarkable. Einstein's theory of gravity tells us that if we run with this metaphor of like a stretch rubber sheet, then in those terms, space-time is incredibly stiff. So that even the most violent accelerations of, say, two colliding black holes far away in the universe will produce only the tiniest distortion to our local patch of space-time, effectively our part of the rubber sheet. And that's equivalent to a movement less than a thousandth the diameter of a proton, or about a million millionth the width of a human hair. And yet, remarkably, the two LIGO interferometers possess this incredible sensitivity. The LIGO detectors are in Hanford, Washington, that's shown in the lower left, and Livingston, Louisiana, in the upper right. Livingston is currently without power because of Hurricane Ida last week. So again, our thoughts are with our LIGO colleagues over there. And um, in fact, we're having a collaboration meeting this week, and it's particularly challenging for our Livingston colleagues to take part. So in those L-shaped detectors, what you have is a vacuum tube running along the four kilometers of each arm. And that vacuum is about one billionth of an atmosphere because even a few stray molecules for, of air would be enough to disturb the path of the laser light that travels along them. And it's those lasers that are really key to detecting the presence of a gravitational wave. 
So let's focus now a bit on what we mean by an interferometer, the second letter in LIGO's acronym. So as the gravitational wave passes by the Earth, it will stretch and squash the space-time around us, causing these tiny changes in the path length, the million millionth of width of a human year. Well, what we're talking about there is tiny changes in the path traveled by the two laser beams. So that means the beam that goes along one arm and the beam that goes along the other arm, they get out of step or out of phase with each other. And when they're reflected from mirrors at the ends of the arms, then they become um, out of step. And that's what reveals the presence of a gravitational wave. The two beams, they display what we call an interference pattern. And that interference changes in time. And that gives us a direct way to measure the change in the stretching and squashing of space-time. We call that the gravitational wave strain. So the gravitational wave strain is incredibly tiny, but what we seek to do with the arms of the interferometer is to amplify that incredibly tiny signal into a change in the laser light phase that we can measure. So that's the theory at least but the technological challenges to actually make it happen, to overcome those challenges were immense. So firstly, the effect of a passing wave as we've been describing is so tiny that even with four kilometer arms, well, they're not nearly long enough to build up a difference in the laser phase that could be detected from a single passage of the beams. So instead, the laser beams are bounced back and forth hundreds of times that greatly lengthens the overall path that the light travels. And that concept of recycling the light in that manner was first devised and introduced by Revice. And Ron Drever then made several crucial improvements to the LIGO design that would vastly improve the performance of the interferometer. So um, Ron modified the way in which light was trapped between the mirrors of each LIGO arm trapping it in what we call a fabry perot resonant cavity. And he invented a, a way to recycle unused light back into the interferometer and a way to tune it to detect gravitational waves with different characteristics so that those with very constant frequencies or those with rapidly changing frequencies could both be detected. Now this latter, uh, a wave with very rapidly changing frequencies, that was especially important for spotting events like colliding black holes, because as the black holes spiral in towards each other, the gravitational wave frequency will indeed change very rapidly. It increases sharply in frequency as the black holes get closer and closer together. So the LIGO detectors operated for several years during the early 2000s, but they didn't make any detections in that time. Believe me, if they had, you would have heard about it. But despite the remarkable green, uh, gains in sensitivity achieved up to that point, the instruments were not yet sensitive enough to make that crucial breakthrough. They were too dominated by local disturbances, what we call noise. But the game plan had always been to upgrade them to advanced LIGO. So building on all of those technological developments and improvements that stretch all the way back to the LIGO founders, the plan was to build initial LIGO to demonstrate the feasibility of laser interferometry, but then to go that next step to enhance the detectors to make them advanced LIGO. Now that process began in 2010, and the University of Glasgow had a crucial role in those developments too, building on the world leading work carried out in the Institute for Gravitational Research. So that was first led by Professor Jim Huff, whom we saw in that slide a few back, uh, back in the 70s. And later, and indeed up until now, by its current director, Professor Sheila Rowan. So the key to taking the LIGO sensitivity to that next level was all about improving the isolation of the detectors from local disturbances, sources of seismic noise, ground disturbance, that could mimic or indeed completely swamp the signals that we were trying to detect. So this factor, was one of the key reasons why there were two LIGO detectors. So a prerequisite for identifying a potential candidate gravitational wave event was that the signal should be seen essentially simultaneously in both of the LIGO detectors. And that would allow us to rule out local noise disturbances that could affect only one 
of the detectors at any given time. And crucial to reducing the impact of those local noise effects was to fundamentally change the approach of how the mirrors at the end of the arms were suspended to try and isolate them as much as possible from surrounding disturbances. And that was achieved by replacing the steel wires that were used in initial LIGO with incredibly delicate, pure silica fibers. And the technology to produce those fibers was pioneered by the IGR, the Institute for Gravitational Research in Glasgow. Silica was much less vulnerable than steel to thermal noise. That's the wobbling of the mirrors due to the random so-called Brownian motions of the atoms and the fibers themselves. So combining that with a whole new method for bonding together the silica fibers and the mirrors themselves, creating effectively a single monolithic piece of glass, these techniques were about to make advanced LIGO a whole lot less noisy. So this upgrade to advanced LIGO was carried out by the LIGO collaboration, funded by the National Science Foundation, but with additional funding, significant leadership from the UK. So the improvements to the suspension system, those were implemented by a UK consortium led by Glasgow, funded by the UK's Science and Technology Facilities Council. And this was a real game changer for advanced LIGO because the combination of silica fibers, heavier mirrors, and also suspending those mirrors on a multi-stage suspension system so that the laser light was bouncing off the lowermost of the masses where the mirror coating was attached to the surface of that mass. And, and because it was suspended at the bottom of the chain, that isolated it even more from seismic disturbances from its surroundings. So effectively, all of that made the advanced LIGO mirrors the quietest place on Earth. The local noise sources were become sufficiently to let the sounds of gravitational waves be heard. And as we heard earlier, this led to the award of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2017. And indeed, these critical improvements in advanced LIGO and the role of Glasgow in bringing them about was explicitly recognized by those Nobel laureates. Of course, we'll never know if the Nobel Committee might instead have recognized Ron Drever had he not passed away in March of 2017. But nevertheless, the three Nobel laureates were all extremely worthy winners. And in Glasgow, we were particularly honored when Barry Barish, in his Nobel Prize lecture, called out the advanced LIGO suspensions work that I've just been describing for its crucial role in making the first detection possible by isolating the detectors from local seismic and thermal noise. So let's hear what Barry had to say. The big improvement that made this detection, maybe the take home message, if you want to tell anybody why and how we made the detection, was the improvement in this nice uh, quadruple and fancy suspension system developed at Glasgow, and the, suspend, the, the isolation from the Earth by se seismic isolation from the Earth by a set of essentially shock absorbers. So there you go, and Barry Barish very graciously acknowledging the contributions that Glasgow had made. Now, the discoveries that LIGO made weren't just about amazing advances in technology. Because in recent years, there's also been remarkable improvements in our ability to calculate precisely the gravitational wave signal that we expect from, for example, two colliding black holes. And how the properties like the masses and the distance of the black holes will change the details of the signal that we might detect. So we can then compare our observed data with all of those predicted waveforms and work out which one gives the best match. And there's no doubt that knowing what type of waveform you're looking for greatly helps to distinguish a true gravitational wave signal from noise. A good analogy here that I use quite a lot in schools outreach is, is to think about trying to make out the conversation of your neighbor in a very noisy room, like for example, the school cafeteria at lunchtime. 
in previous years I've come to the Orkney Festival and been delighted to go and give talks in the schools like Stromness Academy or Kirkwall High School. But I'm always astonished when I go from giving a talk in the classroom to accept the invitation to lunch in the cafeteria and it's bedlam in there with so much background noise. So you can imagine it's quite difficult to hear what your neighbor's saying, but if you know roughly what that neighbor's talking about, then it does make it much easier to work out what they're saying, even when there's a lot of background noise. So that's very much analogous to the process that we go through when we analyze the LIGO data. So what exactly did we detect? So what I've just been playing for a few seconds there is the signal that we detected on September 14th of 2015. And we're representing it both visually, you saw the, um, the pattern on the screen, but also as a sound. Gravitational waves are not sound waves, but the range of frequencies that our detectors are sensitive to corresponds to frequencies that the human ear can hear. So we often use this metaphor of thinking of gravitational waves as the sounds of the universe. And what you were hearing there was the sound of two black holes colliding. In fact, we, we played it a few times back to back, and some of them were shifted to slightly higher frequencies to make it easier for the ear to hear. In reality, the signal was only heard once, and it was over and done with in just a tiny fraction of a second. But by analyzing that signal, we were able to work out what it was telling us about the origin of the gravitational waves that we were detecting. And we worked out that they came from two black holes about 30 times the mass of the sun that merged together at more than a billion light years away from the Earth. So you might say it all happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And what we were able to reconstruct of those final moments before the black holes collided is represented in this video here. I know it looks a bit Hollywood and special effects, but the numbers are all informed by the data themselves. So we're trying to represent the change in the curvature of space time. And that dramatic change is shown by the different colors. We'll just play the video again, if I can get my mouse to come back and talk to me. Let's just click on it again here. And as the black hole spiral in, the gravitational wave signal you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen going to higher frequency, giving us that chirp sound that in the previous slide we heard rendered as a sound wave instead. And crucially, when the black holes merge, they form a bigger black hole. But in the process, a vast amount of gravitational wave energy is released, the equivalent of about three times the mass of the sun released in just a fraction of a second. Now, since then, we've detected lots more gravitational wave sources. So in the final part of my talk, I want to just draw out a few highlights of what we've discovered since 2015 and give you a few pointers towards the future. So what we're viewing in this first animation is 10 pairs of black holes that we detected between 2015 and 2017. So those formed a large part of what we called our first gravitational wave transient catalog, GWTC1. We released that in December 2018. It took a while to write all the papers and complete the analysis of the data, but it contained 10 pairs of black holes merging, not all the same size and mass, and um, some very far away, some not quite so far away. So already building up quite a rich picture of the variety of black hole pair systems that are out there in the universe. But if we rewind the clock to August 2017, there was an even more dramatic event would unfold during those few weeks. Because in August 2017, the two LIGO detectors were joined by Virgo, Advanced Virgo, also upgraded, a detector in Italy close to Pisa in the Tuscany countryside. You can see Virgo shown there. And the big leap forward that Virgo enabled was that having three detectors allows us to pinpoint much more precisely on the sky 
where the gravitational waves are coming from. With only two detectors, well, you can pinpoint to roughly a kind of ring on the sky. So the very first detection, uh, 14th of September 2015, we could only narrow it down to about 900 square degrees on the sky. But once Virgo joined our network, we could do a whole lot better. So that was on August 1st, 2017, just over four years ago. And within just two weeks of Virgo joining, we hit the jackpot because on the 14th of August of that year, we detected another black hole binary, but could pinpoint its sky location so much better than the earlier ones that had been seen prior to that. About 10 times narrower patch of sky. So just a few hundred times the area of the full moon, rather than a few thousand times the area of the full moon. But then just three days after that, an even more dramatic event was detected. This time it wasn't a pair of black holes colliding. It was the first time we detected a pair of neutron stars colliding. Neutron stars are less massive than black holes, but just as weird and exotic in terms of star properties. They weigh as much as the sun, but they're only perhaps 10 or 15 kilometers across. So they're incredibly dense. And when you have two neutron stars orbiting each other, it shakes up space time enough to produce a strong gravitational wave signal. But the signal lasts for longer. And also crucially, the signal, it was believed, could be accompanied by a counterpart signal in electromagnetic radiation in light. Now, we don't expect that when two black holes collide, but when neutron stars collide, astronomers expected that that could give rise to what's called a gamma ray burst, a burst of gamma rays, high energy photons associated with the colliding neutron stars. And that, on August 17th, 2017, is exactly what we saw. So we had the LIGO detection, which followed this chirp-like pattern, more elongated than the black hole binaries, but still with the same general characteristics of an increasing frequency with time as the neutron stars get closer and closer together. And then just about two seconds later, a burst of gamma rays detected by NASA's Fermi satellite and also a signal detected by ESA's integral satellite. So what that allowed us to work out was the sky position very precisely. And LIGO and Virgo operating together gave us a sky position that overlapped where Fermi and Integral were saying the gamma rays came from. And there was just a few dozen galaxies in that sky patch. So optical telescopes were able to follow up and identify the genuine smoking gun, the galaxy that contained the remnant of this pair of merging neutron stars. So what that gave us was essentially a new way to answer a lot of very interesting and deep questions about our universe. One of them was a topic very close to my own heart, measuring how fast our universe is expanding. We're approaching 100 years since we first discovered that expansion, but there are still many puzzles and details to be tied down. To put it bluntly, we don't know yet precisely how fast the universe is expanding. And that seems to present a number of puzzles for other aspects of our cosmological theories to do with what we call dark matter and dark energy. So Edwin Hubble and Georges Lemaitre shown here, the Hubble Lemaitre expansion is well established and indeed gives us strong evidence in support of the universe beginning with the Big Bang. But we'd like to know much more precisely just how fast the universe is expanding. So now we have a new way potentially in which to do it using gravitational wave distances like we got to that neutron star and what we call the redshift of the host galaxy. Now for that, we get the information from electromagnetic observations. So that gives rise to what we call a new field of multi-messenger astronomy, combining gravitational waves with electromagnetic data. And who knows in the future, possibly even neutrinos and cosmic rays as well. And the remnant um, allowed us to identify the host galaxy redshift. And that led to us estimating this expansion rate of the universe. So the bottom graph 
shows our result. And it looks kind of complicated. All you need to take away from this is that our measurements are consistent with the measurements that we get from other more traditional astronomical observations. But those measurements, those traditional astronomical measures of the expansion rate of the universe, they don't seem to agree very well with each other. What you see is the green and orange vertical bands are denoting estimates of the expansion rate by two different methods that give contradictory results. So our gravitational wave estimate isn't very precise yet. So in a sense, we agree with both of them because we've got a large uncertainty represented by the broad blue curve that you see there. But hey, we're just starting out. And what we hope in the years to come is that we'll be able to measure that cosmic expansion rate much more precisely. And who knows, perhaps even resolve the conflict between the green band measurements and the orange band measurements. And the other thing that the remnant of this merging pair of neutron stars really shook things up about was our ideas about the origin of the heaviest chemical elements in the universe. Because we now are much more confident that where the gold and silver and platinum and elements like that are produced is in fact in merging neutron stars, just like we saw back in 2017. So what's been happening since? In my final few minutes, let me just give you an update on the more recent past and a look ahead to the future. So our detectors stopped observing in 2017, just after that neutron star detection, and underwent a series of upgrades, implementing some more of the technological improvements that had been developed in Glasgow and other institutions over the preceding decades. And on April 1st, 2019, we began operating again. And that was our third observing run, and that was very successful. So what was different about our third observing run is that we released information about candidate gravitational wave events almost immediately. And that meant that you could follow us, for example, on social media. You could even download an app to your phone that would give you an alert when there was another candidate signal detected. And the purpose of that was to give other astronomers using electromagnetic telescopes the best possible chance to go and look for a candidate in electromagnetic radiation similar to what we saw back in August 2017. Now, throughout our third observing run, because of the upgrades to the detectors, the number of candidates that we observed was significantly higher than what it had been during the first two observing runs. So the period 2015 to 2017 is runs 01 and 02, and then the candidate event rate really climbs during 2019 through to 2020, which was observing run three. And we split observing run three into two halves. The first half, the first six months, and then the second part from October 2019 through to spring 2020. And in fact, we've already published a lot of our results from the first half of O3, but the second half of O3, well, we're still working on those. So watch this space, those results are coming soon. But in terms of what we've published so far, there's some really spectacular discoveries. For example, we've seen some uneven mass black hole pairs where one black hole is much more massive than the other. We've seen a kind of mystery pair where we have a black hole accompanied by an object where we really can't tell for sure if it's the most massive neutron star we've ever seen or the least massive black hole. It's probably the latter, but we can't be sure. We've seen another pair of neutron stars merge, but this time it was so far away that we didn't see any accompanying signal in light. So the quest for another example, like the one from August 2017, that goes on. And then we also saw the most massive black hole merger that we've announced so far, and that produced a black hole remnant that was more than 100 times the mass of the sun, making it the first example of what we call an intermediate mass black hole. So the results of all of these special events have been announced in a series of really quite high profile and global announcements. So one of my jobs within the collaboration is to help coordinate all of that. And we're very pleased with the level of public interest in what we've been detecting. And in fact, we released a new catalog bringing the total number of events so far to 50 
We released that in, in November of last year. And then, um, if you like, one way to represent all those events in the catalogue is in this diagram. And it's remarkable how um, densely populated, how busy this plot now is. So what you see in blue is all the pairs of black holes that LIGO and Virgo have detected. And then you also see the black holes that we know about indirectly from electromagnetic observations. We actually know about many more such black holes, what we call supermassive black holes. But if we look at just masses close to what LIGO and Virgo are seeing, what we term stellar mass black holes, then now we're seeing many, many more of those in gravitational waves than we see in light. So gravitational wave astronomy is really coming into its own in those terms. And indeed, as we've noted, we've also seen a few examples of pairs of neutron stars merging, although the, the electromagnetic observations of neutron stars are, are still um, more numerous than the number that was seen in gravitational waves. But that will change in time as the detectors are improved further and we observe for a longer time. Our most recent announced discovery came from January 2020. That was in the second part of our third observing run. And in fact, this was two detections only 10 days apart. And these were, we're now very confident, a pair of consisting of a black hole and a neutron star in both cases. So one was observed on um, January 10th and the other um, observed on January 20th of, of that year. And well, basically um, these two events um, give us a rich landscape now of these merging compact stars from pairs of neutron stars through neutron star black hole mergers, all the way to those really massive intermediate mass black holes that we were seeing um, in, in the early part of uh, our third observing run. So here is now the updated family portrait. So all the same events that we saw before, but now with those two new additions. And forgive me, it's a sign of just how many events we're detecting. It gets hard to keep track of the precise dates. And I said that wrong a moment ago. Let me correct myself. It was January 5th and January 15th. As I said, 10 days apart, but not the 10th and 20th as I am incorrectly noted. So what can we learn from these neutron star black hole binaries? Well, um, one of the things that's an interesting question there is whether the neutron star gets torn apart as it's swallowed by the black hole or whether instead it gets swallowed whole. So what we're about to watch is a very short video showing the gravitational waves produced when a neutron star and black hole merge. So this is a simulation of the event. We're going to zoom in on the center in a moment. And this would be a situation where the neutron star more or less gets swallowed whole. And you'll see it um, disappearing inside the black hole in just a few seconds. So the gravitational wave signal for such an event would really be the only way that you would observe such an event. But we can contrast that with other situations where you could have a neutron star that uh, undergoes a rather more extended process of being torn apart before it gets swallowed by the black hole. So just like the previous video, this is a simulation, but these are two different types of neutron star black hole merger that we might hope to observe. Now we think that the two we observed in January 2020 are more likely to be like the former example, where the neutron stars were swallowed whole. So in other words, we think our event is rather more like Pac-Man than like Cookie Monster, not such a messy eater like Cookie Monster, but instead swallowing the neutron star whole like Pac-Man. But as our study of neutron star black hole mergers continues, indeed as our study of all of these compact mergers continues, we'll build up a better picture of exactly in what circumstances the smaller star does get torn apart by its more massive companion and leave behind, therefore, the possibility of some electromagnetic radiation given off as the remnant gets swallowed up. So that's a good example of the kinds of open astrophysical questions that we're going to be tackling in the years to come. And those will help us understand the places where these systems form. So for example, the neutron stars and black holes more commonly form 
in what we call globular clusters, very old stellar systems where the stars are closely packed together, or do they form in younger groupings of stars and so on? So that's what lies ahead. So let me wrap things up, final few minutes, by just giving you a few words about the future outlook. I mentioned before that this, the second part of our third observing run, we haven't published the overall results from that yet. We have released the results about the neutron star black hole binaries that we observed in January 2020, but there are many more candidate events that we announced back during that second half that we're still working on the final confirmation. So we expect that expanded catalog to be announced sometime this autumn. So watch this space, it's coming soon. And then looking ahead, there's going to be a fourth observing run, we hope around the summer of 2022. And what's very exciting about that is that we'll be joined by a fourth ground-based detector, Kagra in Japan. And there will also be further upgrades, further improvements to the advanced detectors, which should lead to a roughly two or threefold increase in the event rate. So we can reasonably expect to be detecting gravitational wave um, discoveries every couple of days, possibly even every day. So that will give us an overall population of detections within just a few years' time um, of many hundreds. And that will give us the opportunity to address some of these deeper astronomy questions when you've got a whole population to look at rather than just individual events. Even though those individual events are super interesting, having the population will make the task of unraveling the origin and evolution of those systems a great deal easier. And then just a few years further ahead, towards the end of this decade, we will have a fifth large detector operating called LIGO India, which will be essentially a clone of LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. So exciting developments ahead there too. And the big advantage of having them spread across the world is that that really helps with pinpointing the sky location of where the gravitational waves came from. Looking even further ahead into the 2030s, there are plans developing rapidly for a third generation of ground-based detectors. The first generation was initial LIGO. The second generation is advanced LIGO and Virgo that are now operating, soon to be joined by CAGRA. But looking ahead to the 2030s, we'll be able to probe even deeper into the universe with a telescope that's called the Einstein Telescope under development in Europe, and then its um, sister project in the US known as Cosmic Explorer. So there are many bridges to be crossed before those are fully realized, but we're well on our way in the advanced planning for the third generation of detectors. And then meanwhile, <clears throat> just like with light, there is an electromagnetic spectrum going from short frequencies to large frequencies. In the same way, gravitational waves span a gravitational wave spectrum. And all that I've talked about so far corresponds to very high frequency, but if we go to lower frequency, the best place to observe those frequencies round about, um, say, a millihertz is with a space-borne detector. And there are exciting projects just getting underway with those. But we have plenty of time for me to come back to Orkney and talk about those. So let me wrap things up at that point by saying I hope I've convinced you that in this short period of nearly six years, gravitational wave astronomy has had a very exciting dawn but it has an even brighter future ahead with the technology that's being implemented and the plans for even more sensitive instruments in the future. Thank you very much. Well, Martin, thank you so much for that. I, I always feel listening to your talks like I'm revising for my final exams and just for a, a moment in time, I feel I could adequately answer an exam question. But anyway, there's quite a few questions come in, and uh, I'm going to try and assemble them in such a way that uh, I can, um, you know, address them in a, some some sort of order. Uh, one of the first ones was that was a very short time between the uh, award of the Nobel Prize between the work and the award. Is is, is that one of the quickest awards? That's uh, that's an excellent question. I'm not entirely sure, but my sense is that it is. And to be fair, there seems to be a general pattern of there being less time. If you look at the award of the, the Higgs discovery, 
and um, that was a little bit longer, but not so much longer. Likewise, um, the discovery for the accelerated expansion of the universe was just over 10 years. So ours was super short in those terms, but you know, there, there are other examples where it's no longer decades you have to wait, but, but, but a relatively short time. Cool. I've got a, a couple here about the LIGO, um, the LIGO establishments. Why was the, why was the distance of four kilometres <clears throat> for the, the LIGO arms chosen? Could it have been longer, much longer? Uh, an excellent question. And again, I'll be very brief, but really essentially it boils down to money. You want it to be as long as possible, but of course, the longer you make the arm, the longer that vacuum tube has to be. You even start to run into trouble with the curvature of the earth if you make the detector too large. So four kilometers was really just a trade-off between long enough to be as sensitive as possible, but keeping the cost down. Uh -huh. And this another one probably because of how you started the, the, the talk with the, the current situation, the Washington LIGO device uh, seems to be situated in a volcanically active area and the Louisiana device seems to be exposed to hurricanes. Uh, with hindsight, would it have possibly been better to put them in safer areas to start with? Um, well, yes, but then, you know, define seismically active. Um, there's almost nowhere in the earth that is completely seismically quiet. But in terms of a susceptibility to a major earthquake, and um, Washington isn't too bad. I'm not an expert in this, but, you know, um, studies were carried out uh, that are certainly, if you like, even more um, unsuitable locations. And being able to mitigate and, and shield yourself from low-level seismic disturbance is absolutely crucial anyway. So uh, in those terms, Washington was as good a location as any. What was much more important, in a sense, was to have the two US-based detectors as far apart as possible. Um, and that's why, as I briefly described at the end, as we move forward into the next level, it's not any more useful for us to have a third detector in, in the US. You want to put that third LIGO detector as far away from the US as you can. There was a plan around 2008 to site it in Australia, but in the end, LIGO India for a variety of circumstances, was the preferred partner. But we also hope there might be an Australian detector built in the not too distant future. There are certainly plans being discussed there too. Now, here's, I may have missed it, or more likely I may have failed to grasp how this works, but how can you tell the, 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 the difference? How can you tell what components in the collisions, how can you tell the difference between them? How do you know it's a black hole? How do you know it's a neutron sure. star? I mean, it's a great like question. And um, I, I should say that, of course, um, that's really a kind of whole talk in itself. It's one of the things that we frequently do in uh, high school um, that, that, that will explore that topic and link it to the kind of material that's covered in the advanced higher and A-level physics syllabus. But perhaps I could just share one slide again, and we'll just try and very briefly answer the question. Oh dear, um, I've not gone to the right slide, but we'll just do the talk in reverse, like Tenet's, the um, Christopher Nolan film, you'll get the talk backwards. But now uh, I hope I'm now sharing my screen. Uh, looks like I am. So let me just um, make a few brief comments about what you see at the bottom of the screen. So can can uh, can it be seen the uh, the two blue and red? Um, yeah, I can't actually see anything. Oh, there. I guess I've just forgot to press share screen. <laughs> there, there we are. are. Right. Hopefully you can see it now. And again, I'll be brief because uh, I'm sure there are more questions. But it's such a good question. This one, it, it really deserves more than just a, a superficial answer. The absolute key here is two things. Firstly, the height of the peaks depends on how far away the sources are but also how close the peaks are together directly tells us what the frequency of the gravitational waves are. And the frequency gives us information about the masses of the source. So essentially think about it like this. If you have um, a really massive object at one end of a pendulum, then, um, let me not try and do it in terms of analogy, I'll probably mess it up because I'm trying to do it quickly. Um, it really just boils down to this. The more massive the black hole, then the lower the frequency of the signal. And, and it's, in some sense, analogous 
to what we call simple harmonic motion, which is, is what one would have um, in, in a system like a pendulum. But um, that, that's just my attempt to link it to the high school syllabus. But the, the essence of it is that the more massive the black hole is, then um, the lower the frequency where the signal reaches its peak. So that's what allows us to work out the masses of the individual objects. Now, we don't do it perfectly. We do it with large uncertainties, but the more sensitive the detectors are, the smaller those uncertainties will become. And that's why there's this constant drive to improve their sensitivity. Sure. You've actually given me, I've got a feel, I've got a feel for that answer, if that makes sense, that sense to you. Mark. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll add to the YouTube channel later, a link to a short paper we wrote that was called The Basic Physics of GW150914. And that tries to set down really in sort of high school physics terms, the key argument as to why we believe these were black holes and why we believe they had the masses they did. Excellent. I would personally appreciate that. That's seriously good. Thank you. Sure. Now, here's an, I like this question. When two black holes collide and produce uh, an effect you can measure a billion light years away, what's the effect on the surrounding galaxy? Ah, uh, no, that's a great question. Again, I'll be brief, but this deserves just digging into the numbers slightly. Two things help me answer the question. The predictions of general relativity tell us that the gravitational wave strain, that's the distortion in space-time produced by two merging black holes or two merging anythings, um, it, it weakens as one over the distance. So um, the strain that you experience, if you were 100 times closer, would be 100 times greater, and so on. Now, a billion light years sounds very, very far away, and indeed it is. But the strain that we measured was so unbelievably small that even if we had been, let's say, the distance from the Earth to the Sun away from those black holes, so let's transport ourselves to be that much closer to the two black holes, how big would the strain have been then? Well, we would have been stretched by about a nanometer a billionth of a meter. So what that's really telling you is how incredibly small the signal was that we, we actually did detect. Because even if we had been so much closer, the signal would still have been a big engineering challenge. And it's because space time, like I said in the top, is incredibly stiff. Even if you're that close to a pair of black holes, space time only shakes by this tiny amount. Sure. And then going slightly lateral or slightly broader. Are there any potential applications for LIGO technology techniques out with astrophysics? Absolutely. So um, let me again try and be brief, but that's a super question again. There's two ways to answer it. Firstly, is applications from gravitational waves directly. Now, we don't know if there will ever be. Who knows? There could be ways that we could harness gravitational waves to do stuff. So that's a, a, a definite don't know. But where there is definitely applications is the technology we've developed to detect them. So that pound driver hall laser stabilization technique that I referred to in, in giving a, a brief overview of Ron Drever's contributions, that for example, is crucial in stabilizing lasers for medical applications, for engineering, even in your CD player, you know, so, um, if you don't focus on the gravitational waves themselves, but the technology that has enabled their detection, there's a whole bunch of ways in which the sensitivity we've needed has required pushing the boundaries of technology to such an extent that we're already reaping the benefits. To give another example, the bonding process that attaches the silica fibers to the mirrors is very, very strong. We're not talking super glue here. It's way stronger than that. And that bonding has been applied to affixing a ceramic um, brake pads for high performance cars. So, you know, the applications are really too many to list, but the crucial point is they're all to do with technology to detect them rather than gravitational waves themselves. I can't imagine what gravitational waves themselves might allow us to do. Maybe there'll never be such applications. But if history tells us anything, we usually find a way to apply all this stuff one way or another. Yeah, there was another question came in there regarding the engineering side, which was, are there any other applications for vibration isolation 
using these innovative styles. Yeah, exactly. So, so one, one good example there, in fact, I'm going to turn that around briefly. Yes, there are, and, and I can share some links about all of that, and again, on the YouTube channel afterwards. But one that's worth mentioning briefly isn't about vibration isolation. It's about controlling vibration just the way you want. And this is led by my colleague now at Strathclyde University, Stuart Reed. So you should get him to the Orkney Festival to talk sometime. What he's doing is using that vibrational control on you know, nanometer scales to stimulate the growth of embryonic stem cells. And they are now at the stage of doing clinical trials of being able to enhance the growth rate of such stem cells enormously. So that's not so much isolating from vibration, but having the ability to control vibrations just the right way to do what you want in a very, very different application. <laughs> Here's a, um, another potential application. Humans have always <laughs> dreamed about the ability of controlling or using space and time distortions for time travel. Does understanding gravitational waves make this dream a possibility in the future? <laughs> um, frankly, no, not in the way that you see in films like Back to the Future or, um, or anything like that. But in some sense, gravity and time are intimately intertwined. So the Nobel Prize winner, Kip Thorne, somehow in his spare time, managed to be executive producer on Stephen and Christopher Nolan's film, Interstellar. And one of the key ideas in that film, without giving away too many plot spoilers, is the way in which time flows at a different rate when you're in a strong gravitational field. So that's a, an effect of general relativity that we already know about, and we already have to take into account when, for example, GPS satellites are working out where you are on Google Maps, we have to account for the fact that time runs ever so slightly faster at the altitude of the satellites compared with down here on the ground. But what we don't know how to do, and we might never know how to do, is to kind of manipulate gravity to switch it on and switch it off, to make it run faster or slower in the way that you just turn a switch to increase an electric current. If we could ever do that, then frankly, we'd be able to make time run at whichever rate we wish. Now that's not quite the same as going backwards in time, that's a whole different ball game, but being able to travel forwards in time at different rates would be possible if just somehow we could control the local gravitational field. And maybe gravitational waves will help us um, unlock that one. Yeah. Well, on the topic of time, Martin, we've come to nearly the end. I've got one last question for you. James Clark Maxwell, although possibly not as well known as Einstein, has a unit of measure in his name. Will we see Einstein for gravitational field strength? That is an excellent point. I don't really know how this process unfolds, but um, gravitational field strength, in some sense, we can just measure using SI units. You know, we can adopt the same units. We can measure the luminosity in watts and so on. But yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Maybe we should be looking instead to create a new unit, an Einstein. So I, for one, would vote for that. So thank you very much for the suggestion. <laughs> well, thank you. I'd like, first of all, to thank our audience for actively taking part and submitting their questions. And of course, Martin, thank you so much for that fascinating, enlightening and thought-provoking talk. You make gravitational waves and Einstein's theories understandable. And uh, at least for 24 hours or so, I am at one with it all. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Brilliant. Now, the next event in the programme is Maxwell's Waves at 11.30am, where Professor Tom Stevenson describes the work and the life of Maxwell, including some of Maxwell's poems set to music. If you're enjoying the festival, please consider donating. Full details of how to do so are below. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and follow our YouTube channel. Remember that the Festival Club will be open this evening at half past nine, and we can all have a blether and a chat quite often with some of the speakers that you've uh, been watching over the last few days. So for just now, thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>